I'm excited today to continue our series, Seven Conversations. Um, if you're new, it's the first ever series, obviously, that we've done at our church. We've taken all of life and we've split it up into seven categories because we want to figure out, as a church, how do I follow Jesus in every area of life? And really, the heart for me is why we did this series. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of tired of just listening to culture, listening to the media, what they have to say about how to spend my money, how to raise my kids, how to spend my time, which is what we're going to be talking about today. What does God say? Not just in one area of my life, come on, not just on Sunday, but every area of my life. I want to learn how to follow, not just believe, right? We've said that we've got a lot of people in church today who believe, but they don't follow. And in this life, when you believe in Jesus privately, you go to heaven. But come on, when you follow Jesus publicly, heaven comes to you. God moves in your life, and you actually see him move in history. Come on, we got a clapper today. I'm glad you came. Come on, I'll preach to you, just me and you the whole time. Anyway, and so and so we want to actually follow. I want to see God move in my life because at the end of your life, contrary to popular belief, the things you will remember most are not the things that you can take credit for. It's not going to be how much money you made or what job title you have or how many houses you own. It'll be what God did. Come on, God took cancer away. God reconciled a marriage. God opened blind eyes. We've seen all those things in our church already. And so I want to see more of that. I don't know about you. I want to see heaven come down. And we have. We've seen heaven come down already in just three weeks. In fact, today, Captivate Church is officially 15 days old, and we've already seen 43 new people commit to following Jesus. That's pretty good. Come on. If you weren't going to clap for anything else, you know, you, you can clap for that. That's pretty, pretty exciting. And, and so we've seen God move, and that's really, that's really great. Here we are getting to be a part of what Jesus is doing. You know, it, it's really easy and great for me to know that Jesus said he would build his church, so I don't have to. Come on, how many people know Jesus is doing the heavy lifting? I just get to share it. You know, people say, man, starting a church, that's kind of nerve-wracking. Not really when I remember that Jesus is doing it, and I just get to be a part of it. And so I was praying last night about the ministry that we get to do. it. And hear me, a lot of stuff we've done already is really exciting, right? We've had a lot of great feedback the last couple of weeks. Is this really a new church? It seems like you've been around. There's all these people. There's all these opportunities to serve and lead and all this stuff. And it's really exciting. We've celebrated it really well and all this. But I just want us to remember that the real work of ministry is not just done on Sunday. It's not done in front of lights or with microphones, but it's done in the shadows when nobody's watching. It's done, it's done in the moments when it's just you and God or the moments when you're working with somebody who's going through something hard. And we've already had people come into our church, even on the, the biggest moments when we celebrate, who are going through sickness, who are going through a divorce, who are losing their job. And this is the real work of ministry. And so I wanted to remind you today that really God is calling us to build people from the broken place. And we're willing to do that. And we're excited to do that, to work with people in, in really the hardest parts of their life. This is what God has called us to. And I know that we live in an entertainment culture, but how many people know we don't need more entertainment in church. We need a move of God. We need God to move. We need him to show up. We need him to do something that really we can't, we can't do. And so we need an encounter with the real God today. But the problem is, and by the way, that's if you believe or you don't believe. Come on, some of you here, you're, you're already a believer. Some of you aren't. And I love that you're here. By the way, you're a special guest. I'm extra glad you're here. But if you do believe, you also need God to move in your life. But the problem is of what we're going to talk about today is that often we're too distracted. We're too busy to actually have a moment where God will move in our life. And so we're going to talk about time today. Some of us need to take another look at our schedules. You know what I mean? Come on, it's going to get a little bit convicting. Are we okay for that? We got your seatbelt on. The Lord's going to show up and speak to you, hopefully. But hopefully you're not too distracted again to hear from the Lord today. The truth is there's a lot of noise in our life. A lot of voices, it's kind of hard to hear God's voice sometimes, and so we're going to talk about it today. We're going to take a fresh look at how we spend our time, because what you give your time to is what you worship. That's what we're going to talk about. So with that, let's go ahead and pull out our Bible. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. If you've got a Bible, you can pull it out. If not, we're going to have it up on the screen for your convenience. Anybody got a Bible today, just for fun? Anybody carry a hardback? Yes. The spiritual people, you're here. Okay, great. Let's, let's go ahead and read. In the, at this point in the story, Jesus do, is doing what Jesus does. He's on the move. He's going from one group of lost people to another, uh, and, he's, and he's really telling them the gospel. He's telling them the good news, and, which is really great. And like I said a minute ago, you know, there's a couple ways to build a church. Uh, you, you can be a little more attractional. You could add some more lights and programming and all that, and we'll do some of that, and that's good. Or you can do what Jesus did. 
You can go to the dark corners of the city and go to people who do not yet know God and not so much lift up an attraction, but lift up the name of Jesus and just kind of see what happens, you know? And I don't know about you, but I kind of like that second part. And, and so that's what Jesus does. He goes from one group of people who need to hear the truth to another, keeps it real, he spreads hope. Here's what it says, Luke chapter 10 in verse 38. It says, as they continued their journey, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She also had a sister named Mary. And so what we're going to see right off the bat is that this section of Scripture is a story of two sisters. We're only going to read about three or four verses today, but it's about these two sisters. And what we're going to notice is how they spend their time is very different. And what you're going to notice right off the bat is which one are you more like? Are you more like Mary or are you more like Martha? And I'll let you answer that for yourself. Um, But here's what it says. Mary, Mary is the other sister. She sat before the master. That would be Jesus. She sat before Jesus. Look at this. Hanging on every word that he said. I don't know about you today, but I I hope that's me today. Hanging on every word that Jesus had to say. Some of you think I came here to preach. I actually came here to hear, hear from God, just like you did, because this is also my church. And so I would want God to speak to me. And so for you, maybe it's like, I'm not even really here. I know that sounds kind of strange, but I really believe that God wants to speak something to you today, specifically, right where you're at. You know, sometimes, this happened uh, every week. Actually, the last two weeks we've had, I've had somebody come up to me and say, wow, that message, you know, I just, I needed it. And I say, really? Tell me what you needed. You know, like, I'd love to hear it. And and both times I've had somebody say something to me that I, I didn't actually say. You know, they're like, hey, you said this. And I'm like, hey, I didn't actually say that, you know. That was the Lord speaking to you. And hey, that's great. You know, I, I love that the Lord could work through me or whatever, but there's something specific, whether I say it or not, that God would love to speak to you. And I would really hate for you to miss that. She's hanging on every word that he had to say. But Martha, on the other hand, she was pulled away by all that she had to do. You know, she was kind of busy. She had a full schedule. She wasn't really sitting with the Lord. Martha's busy by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in, interrupting them. Master, don't you care? Don't you care? And I would imagine that there's somebody in here today, and you'd be asking God that same question. Don't you care? Don't you care what I'm going through? And I think a lot of times we feel like God is quiet or he's not moving in our life. And the reality is of why that is true is because he's not very quick to feed our dysfunction. And here's what I mean by that. I referenced this a few weeks ago. But a lot of times we go to God and we ask and we pray for him to help out with things that are keeping us far away from him. You know, we ask God to give us more money when it's really money's the thing that has us. You know, like, God, give me more money. He's like, I don't want to give you more money because it's actually going to create a bigger divide between us. We go and we say, God, will you give me more success so I can feel better than the people around me? You don't say it like that, hopefully. I mean, and if you do, that's kind of on you. You know, you should have you known better. Or can you give me another relationship so I can be impure again? Again, you don't say that, but we ask God to help with things that keep us between, keep us between him, and we say, God, don't you care, and we're wondering why he doesn't give us more of the thing we think we need, and that's because God's hope to you today is not to give you more of the thing you think you need, but rather free you from the notion that you need anything besides Jesus at all, and so, and so he doesn't always feed into our dysfunction. We wonder, do you even care? Master, don't you care what I'm doing? My sister has abandoned me to the kitchen. Tell her to lend me a hand. Here's what Jesus says. Martha, Martha, Martha. Dear Martha, you're fussing far too much, and you're getting worked up over nothing. One thing is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. I'm excited today to continue with conversation number two as we talk about time. And if I had a subtitle for the message, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. I called it Death by Distraction. Death by distraction. Hopefully you're not too distracted today to hear from God. Anybody not too distracted today to hear from God? Anybody here? Come on. Yes, some of you are here. Come on, if you are here, stop being lazy. Take some notes. God's watching you. Anyway, um, anybody in here, you, uh, you'd consider yourself adventurous. Come on, you like going outside. You like being in nature. You like turning your phone off. See all the hands that went down after that third part, you know? I thought you were with me, you shallow people. But anyway, there was a time... In my life, when I went on a backpack trip every single year, and when I would go on this trip, we'd go way up in the mountains, and we would get away, and by away, I mean like away. We would go days without seeing other people. We didn't have really much of our stuff in our normal life, and we had no cell phone reception, okay? And that, for some of us, was a really, really big deal. That was kind of a stretching. Any of you have ever been away from your phone for a few days? You lost your salvation, right? I mean, it was, it was hard. It was really hard, and so for some of us, 
it was really stretching. And I remember back then, one of the first times I went on this trip, I was of the wise, you know, well-to-do age of 14. And so all I did was text back then because how many people you text in a day determines how cool you are, right? Some things never change. But anyway, and so that's what I did. All I did was text. And so I remember some guys would make fun of me, like, man, you're not going to go two hours, you know, without your phone. I'm like, no, I got this. And so we put our phone away. We get up on the trail. And, like, immediately, subconsciously, I'm like, doing this. You ever do this? It's like you're looking. It's like I lost a major organ, you know. I'm like looking for the thing that's on. I didn't have it. And, and it was weird. It's like I lost part of my life and shortness of breath came over. You know, you ever have a cell phone headache? Anybody get? Me either. That's really weird. But anyway, I, it's like something happened. I lost something big in my life. And remember the end of the week, I ran down that mountain so fast to get to my phone. But here's what happened. I get to my phone and it wouldn't turn on because I accidentally left it on, and so it was dead, and so was I. I mean, the headaches came back, you know, and the shortness of breath, and by the time I got to a charger, I plugged in and it turned on, you'd have thought, like, I was revived, you know, like, my life came back to me, and it was in that moment, not any moment before, but it was in that moment when I realized I may have an addiction. Maybe. I'm not sure. It was, it was possible. I might have a problem, but I was thinking today, it can't just be me. There's probably some people in here that are the same way. In fact, can you turn to the person next to you and say, are you addicted to? Can you say that? Are you addicted to? Wait for an answer. They may need some prayer. Yeah, they might need some real help. In fact, don't ask them. Just ask their spouse if they have one because they'll give you the real answer. But believe me, it's, it's not just me. It's not just me, but I really think a lot of us, we have an addiction to our phones. Research would tell us that in this day and age that we live in, we've never had more information at our fingertips. We live in the age of information. Whatever you want to find, it's just one click away. If you want to find a new restaurant, it's just one click away. If you want to write a paper, it's just one click away. If you want to find a new romantic relationship, it's just one swipe away, right? And if that's you today, I'm glad you're here. You know you need, you need extra prayer. But if you want to creep on somebody on social media, it's just one click away. Just don't double click, you know, because then they'll know, and then that'll be weird. But <laughs> everything you want, it's just one click away. It's amazing to me because our phones and social media, we have more information on each other than ever before. But also, I think, because of our phones and social media, we're more disconnected from each other than ever before. We're more distracted than we've ever been. In fact, the other night, I was at home supposedly spending quality time with my wife, Monica, she's about five inches away from me. I worked late, and I said, hey, we'll have time tonight, you know. And so I get home, and, and we're laying there, and, and I didn't even notice. I was on my phone the whole time, and I'm just texting. And as I'm texting, this text pops up, and it's from Monica. And she says, hey, how's your wife doing? And she's like right next to me. So I look at her and say, hey, what? Hey, you know, like, why'd you send me that? You know, I'm right here. I'm right here. And she looked at me, and she said, yeah, yeah, you're here, but you're not here. And what she was saying was, is, yeah, you're here physically, but mentally, spiritually, emotionally, you're nowhere to be found. You know what you are? You're, you're distracted. And I think a lot of times as we follow God, we think because we're here, because sometimes we're present in church once a month for some of you, because sometimes we go to Bible study or because we read the verse of the day, it, it, we think we're here with God, but, but really we're disconnected. And he would look at us and say, hey, you're here, but you're not here. You're not here. You're not really with me. You're not really you're not really present. You know, what's amazing to me about social media is that with just one click of the button, you can be a follower. You can be a spectator and have all the information you want on one another. But just because you have information on one another doesn't mean you're connected to one another. And I think the challenge can be in 2018 is that a lot of people think following Jesus is like social media. You know, it's like this quick fix cup of coffee spirituality. It's on-demand Jesus. It's eye face. It, it's this instant connection without having to devote any time to it. You know, you can just Google your faith. You know, you can just Google questions you have rather than spending time with God. But the problem is, and I'll say like this, a lot of you come in here today and you need direction in your life. You're at a crossroads in a romantic relationship with what you're going to do with work, with something spiritual in your life, and you want to you want to Google it. You want it to happen right away. You want God to speak to you out of nowhere. But, but with God, it's like this. He doesn't give direction without devotion. You need to spend some time with Him. It doesn't just happen overnight. I mean, we have never had more information at our fingertips about Jesus, yet I think sometimes we're never more disconnected from Jesus because following Jesus is not a click of a button. It, it's not just something that can happen real quick where you become a spectator, but rather following Jesus saying, Lord, I want to be a participator. I want to be involved in what you're doing on this journey. I want to I follow you. I want to recognize that you're here. I want to be here and here and here. 
We want to be present with God. But the problem is most of the time we can't because we're distracted. We're distracted. I did some research. In fact, I found that the average office worker can work for up to 11 minutes on a given task before becoming distracted. 11 minutes. The average student, two minutes. The average internet browser user, 40 seconds before becoming distracted. And here's the worst part. Scientists say once you're distracted, it takes up to 25 minutes to refocus. In fact, you should try telling that to your spouse, you know, and they're like, hey, listen to me. Hey, just give me 25 minutes to focus, and then I'll listen to you. You know, it just, it probably wouldn't work. I want to be focused, but I can't because I'm distracted. And why are we distracted? Because we're busy, you know. You got a lot going on, and you're like, anybody busy in here? Come on, let's, let's be honest. You're busy. Who's, who's not busy in 2018, right? Tell, try telling somebody nowadays that you're not busy. They'll look at you funny, right? They'll be like, how dare you, you know? You're a burden to society. Stop enjoying your life. Like, everybody's busy. They are. In fact, I talked to a guy the other day on the phone, and this guy used to be really involved in church, got a new job, never seen him again. And he called me out of the blue, and I was excited to talk to this guy. I said, hey, man, how's it going? He's like, oh, my gosh. Man, listen, I don't have any time. This job is taking all my time. I don't have time. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for friends. No time. You ever listen to someone and start sweating? You know, you're like stressed out afterwards. And I'm wondering why he's so busy. I'm wondering why he doesn't have time. And let me just throw this out there. I think busyness is a mentality. I know some people that don't have, they're not married, they don't have any kids, they don't own any home, they have one job, and they're freaking out. And I know other people who are married, they have multiple kids, own multiple homes, and have multiple jobs, and are very involved in church, and they're thriving. You know, it's like you can actually get a hold of them. And this guy, and again, he's a great guy, he just no. He, he just started his first job, no kids, not married, whatever, and he's freaking out. I'm wondering why. I said, hey, man, why do you give all your time to this job? And he said, I owe it to society. And I said, what do you owe to God? I don't know. You know, it's just kind of crazy. Like, wh- what does God get out of your life? It's this busyness mentality that we have in, in our life. We feel like it's our duty to be busy, but here's where the sermon takes a turn. I think the real reason that we're busy is because we love being busy. Because did you know that busyness is actually a narcotic to your soul that gives you a feeling of self-importance? I read an article a few weeks ago that talked about the top two addictions in the United States of America. And do you know what they are? It's social media and workaholism. Okay, so it's not weed, alcohol, or drugs, right? Those aren't the real problem. Those are what we use to medicate the real problem, which are what? Comparing ourselves to people and striving for more being busy, going, going as hard as we can. But uh, the problem is we do this, we do this, we do this. We run right past Jesus most of the time. Running, 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 and much of the time it feels empty. You know what it is? It's death by distraction. It's not that you are dead, but you're living like it because you're letting the distractions of this life keep you from that which you were made for. You're busy, and you know who you sound like? You sound like Martha. You know, Mary's hanging on every word Jesus has to say, but Martha, she's pulled away by all that she had to do. Martha's busy. Can you relate to her? I can. Her Savior is sitting in her living room. She has no time for him. That's crazy. When I think about it, he's probably five inches away. He's probably five feet away, but she's too distracted. She believes the only way to please her God, the only way to live a life that matters is to do more. You ever feel like that? I'm doing all that I can, more than I can. It's not enough. I don't feel like I'm enough. I'm doing everything I possibly can. I, I got to keep going. I can't slow down. I'll rest when I'm dead. You ever hear people say that? I'll be content when I'm dead. You know, it's like, dude, you are dead now. You just don't know it. That's tough. That's really hard for you that you, that you think that. But the problem is we, we keep going, we keep going. But a lot of times we feel empty while we keep going, while we give everything that we have. We're trying to prove something. I need to use my time to prove that my life really matters and so busyness and you know what busyness does it allows us to dodge how we really feel you know like I'm not feeling worthy today but if I could do one more thing you know if I could just fill my schedule if I could fill up my phone I don't even need to look at it but it's still it's still there and I'm going to say it again the savior of the world is sitting in her living room she had no time for him she believed that it was better for her to do something for him rather than to receive from him she, she had things she had to do. That's what the Bible says, all the things she had to do. You know, we all have reasons as to why we don't spend any time with God, right? And I, I hear from people all the time. They say, man, listen, you don't get it. I, don't, I can't go to church. I got a lot of things I got to do, you know? And, and we, we think there's these things in our life that nobody else will do, so we consume ourselves with it because we have to do it. And people say, I don't, I don't have to. Listen, man, you don't get it. I have to work more because I have to provide. Like, you're right. It's not like God wants to do that for you. 
You know, I have to do this bad habit. I have to have some kind of refuge. You're right. It's not like God wants to be that in your life. You know, I have to do more. I have to prove myself. You're right. It's not like God wanted to do that for you when he made you in his image and sent Jesus to save your life. It's not like he wants to do it. You know what? You, you should prove yourself. Quick, lose a few more pounds. Make a little bit more money. Do a few more things. Then maybe you'll prove it because I'm not convinced yet. Martha's going, going, going. She's about to burn out like some of you are. Jesus sees it. He's trying to help her. And what's funny about Martha, I don't know if you noticed this, Martha's trying to pull Mary into her dysfunction. Did you notice that? She's going down. She's like trying to pull Mary in with her. You ever notice how when you're miserable, you go and complain to everybody around you because you want them to be miserable with you? Like God forbid you be miserable by yourself. That would be horrible, right? And so we try to pull people into it. And then she has the audacity to ask Jesus to help. It's like, hey, Jesus, do you see Mary? She's having too much fun. She's enjoying you too much. Get her up. She needs to spend her time as I spend my time. But what I love about Mary is it doesn't happen. Mary doesn't let the influence of others change her direction. She doesn't allow the distraction of others to divert her attention. She's focused. You ever notice how it's the expectations of other people that dictate how we spend our time? And I referenced this a few weeks ago, but some of us make these big goals in our life and we attach ages to it, you know? And then we spend all of our time trying to get there. Man, by 25, I better be married or else. Or else what? You'll be alone forever, you know? Man, by 30, I better own a home. Okay, but says who? Who told you that? You know, by 62, I better be living on a golf course, retired. Why? Like, why, why are you doing that? Where did that come from? And all of a sudden, we make these goals. And what we do is we spend all of our time getting there. That's what demands our whole life. It's our north star. And what happens is, and this happens to people all the time, they go five years, ten years, they go their whole career, and then they look back and say, why did I do that? I forget. Why did I chase that? I don't know. Who told me to do that? I'm really not sure. And here's what's going on. We're using our time to prove that our life mattered. Because that would be horrible, right? You get to the end of your life and it was like, it didn't matter. You, you didn't earn enough. You didn't, you didn't impress enough people. That would be an absolute, that would be horrible. That would be the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And so this is what the devil does. He tries to distract us from the mission God has on our life to distract you, to go prove yourself over here. And it takes you in a completely different direction. In fact, that's what we studied last week. We studied Genesis chapter 3. It's the first ever sin. It's the first ever temptation. And you notice how the devil did it. He came to Eve. And by the way, Eve was made. She was fearfully and wonderfully made. She was made in the image of God. And the devil comes and he says, are you sure? Are you sure you like God? You should prove it. You should prove it. You should go eat this tree because then you'll prove it. And it was his expectation of her that changed her direction. The problem was she was already like God, but now she felt like she had to prove it to some people. So she went on. Did you know they did the same thing with Jesus? Yeah, the devil goes to Jesus, and the first temptation that, that Jesus gets is, are you sure you're the son of God? He said, if you're the son of God, prove it. Show me. Why don't, you, why don't you perform some miracles already? He hadn't done any of that yet. Why don't, you, why don't you prove it? Why don't you make all these people worship you? Why don't you prove it? And he does the same thing wha- with us. People, people come into our life, and it's their expectation that divert our direction. You notice that. People come to your house, and they're like, oh, you live here. This is cute, you know. Oh, you work there? Okay, neat, you know. Oh, this is your church. Oh, you'll figure it out one day, you know. And all of a sudden, you feel threatened. You're like, dang it, I, I did not meet their expectation. Now I need to go prove it. I need to go prove that I matter. And all of a sudden, your, cha- your direction has changed, and you spend all of your time proving to people that, you're, that you matter, that your life counted. And, and, and he did it to Jesus, like I said. And, and here's why he did it to Jesus, and this is going to help some of us out. A few verses before he tempts him, there's this moment. We're not going to read it for time, but Jesus gets baptized in the Jordan Ritter, River, and he comes up, and God makes this proclamation, this, this announcement that he wants everybody to know. He said, hey, this is my son Jesus, and by the way, just so you all know, I'm, I'm already pleased with him. He's already enough. And at that point, he had done no miracles. He preached no sermons. He had seen no converts. He hadn't proven anything. And God said, he's enough already. He's enough because he's my son. Because Jesus was not valuable because of what he did. He was valuable because of who he came from. And the same is true with you. Did you know that God's not in love with what you do? He's in love with you? You don't need to go prove it. You you don't. And so we live this life chasing this notion. This is why people want more time in their life, right? I said this a few weeks ago, people want more time because they're terrified. They'll go their whole life without proving that their life actually mattered. But can I tell you today, you don't need more time because it doesn't matter how much time you have if you're going in the wrong direction. 
if you're distracted. You'll actually never get there. It's wild. If you just sit with Jesus. What if you just came to church today and God was already pleased with you? You just woke up today and you came in and you spent a little time with him. He was already happy. He was already saying, you're enough. Now you can follow me. You don't need to go find it or prove it. You could be like Mary. Mary's not distracted. I love it. She ignores the pressure from her sister that was distracting her from her Savior. Mary's got her voices in order. And what I mean by that is as you look at the story, notice there's two voices. One's telling her to prove it to Jesus. The other one's saying, why don't you sit down and enjoy Jesus first? before you do anything. And that's kind of hard when you have multiple voices. To say yes to one is to say no to the other, and that's hard, and you know what that's like, because you all have a lot of voices in your life, don't you? You got a lot of people telling you, come on, you look at your phone, you got Instagram, you got news feeds, you got Twitter, you got like, you know, talk show, you got all this stuff that you watch, you got ESPN, you got Joanna Gaines telling my wife yet to buy more decor for the house, it's never enough, my gosh, pray for me. But you know what, my wife showed me this the other day, it's really interesting, if you have an iPhone, if you don't have an iPhone, you're welcome in any way. We'll pray for you. But if you do have an iPhone, if you go on your settings about halfway down, you have permission if you want to try this on your phone. But halfway down, there's this thing called battery. And I'd never known this before, but it actually tells you which apps you have been on the most in the last 24 hours, in the last seven days. And so if you want to feel really convicted, go look at that, because that is really what shows what voices that you're listening to in your life. Which ones are the most? Mine by far is texting and on the phone. I got ESPN. I got YouTube. I got fantasy football. Help. My team's not doing well. I got Yelp. I got all this stuff. For you, it might be different, but these are the voices that we listen to. But you know what else she showed me? And I didn't know this. Um, I'd never used this feature before. Some of you don't know about this feature, but you need to know. There's this button when you look at your phone. It's on the right. And if you hold it down for five seconds, you can actually turn your phone off. I know that some of you have never done that before, but sometimes, come on, you got to eliminate every distraction so you can hear God's voice. It's not that he's not speaking. It's that everything else is too loud. And so sometimes you've got to lay aside every distraction so you can hear him speak to you. This is what Mary is doing. She's not distracted like, like Martha. Martha, Martha, she's distracted. And look what it says in verse 41. Verse 41, Jesus said to her, Martha, you're worried about many things. And what he's saying is you've got many voices in your life. You've got many things demanding your time. But I see what's really going on. You're trying to prove something to me and to the people around you, and your activity is not hiding how you really feel, and that's why I'm here. I'm here to give you all the worth, all the value that you could ever need. I'm here to validate you so that you could spend some time with me, and I feel like God is shouting at some of us today. He's saying, I know what you're going through. You think by filling your schedule, you can avoid what's really going on. I I want you to sit down with me. I want you to spend some time with me, and then it says this, the last verse, verse 42. It says, one thing is essential, and Mary has chosen it, it's the main course, and it won't be taken from her. I want you to know today that Jesus would like to feed you main course. And what I mean by that is this. He wants to feed us something wholesome. A lot of us have become used to this five-hour energy spiritual life where you live on shots of, it's the verse of the day. It's worship only on Sunday. By the way, if you only worship God on Sunday with your time, you're missing out. Can I say that? You're missing out. It's a great start. It is, but the most intimate times that God has waiting for you are times to be alone with Him. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But He wants to give you something wholesome, not this quick fix, cup of coffee, spirituality. How many people know that when you live on five-hour energy, eventually you're going to crash? It's just not going to be enough for you when you hit the struggles and, and, and the hardships in life. You have no chance to stand against the enemy, the attack that He has on your life. You've got to get alone with Jesus. You see, the difference between Mary and Martha is actually not their ability. It's not their knowledge. It's not even their special favor from God. I know some people in church think that some of us have like a special connection to God. He only speaks to some of us. It's not true. Friend, it was like that before Jesus, but the Bible says that the veil was torn. There's no more barrier between you and God. You have the same access that I do. And so the difference between them is not It's not their ability, it's not their knowledge, it's not special favor. It's who had their attention. It's who had their time, right? And Mary gives her time to Jesus, so she experienced intimacy with Jesus. And I would ask you that. Do you experience intimacy with Jesus? You say, well, what does that look like? Well, you'll know when it happens. You know, do you feel the presence of God? What's that like? You'll know. 
Do you hear the Father's voice? Do you see the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? It's a term in the Bible, but it's, it's all these things that describe parts of the character of God. Do you have peace in your life? Are you kind? Do you forgive people? Do you experience joy? Again, you'll know when it happens. Are you experiencing this in life? And a lot of people, and I don't care if you've been in church for 20 years, they're not experiencing this. Or we're not having this with God because we're distracted. But let me tell you, if you don't spend time with Jesus, nothing can substitute that. Nothing can substitute quality time with God. And I would say this, quality time is Jesus' love language. You, you ever taken the love languages test? Anybody take the love languages test? Somebody? Somebody clapped. I like it. You're, you're a big fan. I, that's cool. I didn't write it, so you need to clap for me. But anyway, um, I took the test. I found out that I have all five. It's high ma- I'm high maintenance. It's kind of hard to love me. But anyway, um, what I think that the test really helps out with is it really it, it shows you in, in your relationship or in your marriage the one commodity that your spouse can't live without. It's like there's no substitute for it. I don't know if your spouse is like mine, but mine needs quality time. And so what I know about that, nothing can substitute quality time. Nothing. Okay, there's nothing I can say, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing I can give, maybe a Sephora gift card. Other than that, there's nothing else that can substitute that I have to spend quality time with her. Nothing takes its place. And so, and such is true with Jesus, he needs our time. When you don't spend time with someone, you don't have intimacy with them. When you don't have intimacy with someone, you don't have much of a relationship. And with God, when you don't have much of a relationship, you're left with religion. And religion is the camouflage that is hiding what's really not there, the fact that you're really not close to God. It's hiding. You carry your Bible around. You read the verse of the day. You're in a small group. Where's Jesus? It feels kind of empty. Why? Because I don't have any time with him. And I can tell you today that if you don't have time every day to hang on every word that he has to say, you might be taking your life a little too seriously. Lord, I got to get up. I got to get to work. I got to get to that appointment. Right, I got to get ready. I got to put on my mascara and my highlight and my contour and my bronzer and my blush. All this. Hey, listen, if, if, if the, all the things you do in your day, if it keeps you from that moment with Jesus where you're hanging on every word he has to say, you might be taking your life a little too seriously because it will be inevitable that at the end of your life you'll have regret by how you spent your time. Because a day will come when getting ahead in life, that whole thing disappears. And all you have left is how you spent your time. And the only thing you'll think about is how much time you spent with him and sharing him with the world around you. You see, quality time alone with God, with no distraction, it's necessary. It actually prepares you for where you're going, and that's what you see all throughout the Bible. You see men and women of God sacrificing distraction for direction. Did you know that before Moses ever led his people out of Egypt, he had an alone time moment with God at the burning bush where nobody was around, and God told him where to go? Did you know that Joshua, before he ever led his people into the promised land, what does God say to him in Joshua 1.8? Hey, I want you to meditate on this word day and night alone with me. Did you know that Daniel, before he ever gets into the lion's den, a few verses before he has an alone time moment with God in his room where nobody's around. The Bible says he did what he always did. He got on his knees. He looked at God and he prayed. And he knew he was about to get arrested. He had a alone time moment with God. David, before he ever becomes king, for 20 years he's just in the field. Worshiping, praising Jesus, having alone time with him in church. I'm really thankful today that before Jesus ever saved you, before he ever saved me, he had a moment where he wanted to give up. He felt like giving up in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he had an alone time moment with God where where God gave him direction and he told him where to go. Listen, if you don't know where you're going, it's because we're not spending time with the one who knows where you should go. Nothing can substitute quality time with God. And so here's how I want to close. 